think about this idea. So there, you're in the technical field, theoretical physics. It's heavily mathematical. I mean, that's the language of the, of the field. It's very technical and specialized. And uh, there are very relatively few uh, black people who excel at that craft or at least have been accepted within the fraternity. Um, and there's a huge gap in the test scores. When you do GRE, quantitative, or whatever it is, and you look at the ratio of the population statistics, the overlapping bell curves and whatnot. What do you think? So there's two different claims. One of them is, well, if the you know, field is technical, it requires mathematical abilities and uh, accomplishments. And if there's racial differences, well, you would expect racial differences in the representation versus the theory that says those tests don't really measure very well who's going to be a good physicist and who's going to be a good economist or not. And uh, if you're getting exclusionary results from the test, you probably need to think about different ways of selecting people for, uh, for your program of study. To which many conservatives, and I don't mean Trump voting conservatives, I mean, you know, people who want to keep doing mm -hmm. science the same way it's always been done would say, come on. Man, I know the difference between somebody who's in the 99th percentile of the distribution of math ability and somebody who's in the 90th percentile. I, I know the difference in terms of how their minds work and how quickly they're able to assimilate and process and extend. Calculate. Uh, conceive, generalize. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I know the difference and I, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, it's those people, the people who are at the 99th percentile, not at the 90th percentile, who are going to be the ones, by and large, with very few exceptions, who are going to be making scientific advances. Where mm -hmm. would you situate yourself in that debate? I think I would, I would situate myself um, with a little of both, actually. So let me let me let me um, expound on how I would situate myself, um, because my it, it is how I actually um, approach my own sort of evaluation of students, and my, you know I I have to you know I mentor PhD students. I have to train P students to get their PhD. So, and as far as I'm concerned, you know I make it really clear to those students: look, it is my job. My, my job before I you know you're granted a PhD, I find that you have what it takes is to say. I signed off on a PhD with, along with the committee, is that you're ready. You're ready to go off and actually you have the skill sets, you have the tools to succeed as a physicist. And so I do believe that there are basic competencies, um, like, you know, if you want to learn how to fly an airplane, you know, would you go on, go into an airplane with somebody that kind of shaky on a certain tool or skill sets to learn how to land an airplane? You wouldn't. I wouldn't. So I think that likewise in in physics or I can just say in general, but there are things some basic competencies. How those competencies are evaluated, how we screen for that, right, may differ. Um, so some people may shine if they're sitting facing a piece of paper with a pen. Some people may shine, may be able to reveal that on a blackboard, showing, showing and telling. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've been in situations where students who are really good test takers in this mode, in the sort of sitting writing mode, if I, if I uh, there, you know, there've been semesters where I would give both a midterm that was a written midterm, but then the final would be an oral. You, go, you get on the blackboard and you calculate. And I found, interestingly, that there are some students that performed really well in this mode, in the writing mode. But when I asked them to get on the blackboard and show me a calculation, they freeze up. Um, there's, I don't know, cognitive dissonance, for lack of a better word. So again, I, I believe in it's important that there are uh, basic competencies that we should agree on for a given field. Um, at, a, at the different levels that we are, you know, we're testing or we're looking to evaluate. Um, and, and we can debate and agree on what those things are. And I think once we do, then I believe that there are different modes, different ways of evaluating and, and screening for that. And so that's where I stand on that. So therefore, I think that now there's a question of how you 
how you regulate that and whether it's doable. You know, I mean, at a large university, it's much harder to do that. At a small college like the one I went to with 1,200 students, it may be more realistic to evaluate in a more multidimensional manner. Okay, that, that's interesting. Do you think there is a racial, black, white, Asian, Latino difference relevant of the sort that you just got through calling attention to that your point is relevant to how different groups of people are being assessed? Um, that's a good, yeah, that's another good um, point. I mean, it's interesting. I've been um, a college professor since 2005. Okay, so it's like, what, it's close to 17 years now, right? Yeah. No, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I've been a college professor for about 17 years now. So now from my own personal experience, I would say, um, I, you know, I have, I've seen some, um, black students walk on water, like, like some of the, like I has, I just had a student uh, a couple of years ago at Brown. It was a freshman, a first year student, African American fellow, who was sitting in my graduate level general relativity class, and this guy was already taking graduate level math courses and acing them, getting A's. Um, you know, he'll be graduating with. Um, He'll be graduating this next year, having completed half of the PhD curriculum for mathematics, pure mathematics. So again, but if you look at this kid, he has like tats in, around his body, you know, like he's one of those guys. Uh, you definitely want, not want to read that book <laughs> too much, right? Um, so, but in terms of, let me see if I want to get your question correctly. You're saying in, in terms of how... Students are being evaluated differently. Or, no, you you uh, yeah, made the it, point yeah. that kids might have uh, a mm -hmm. mastery of skill, a skill set, but be able to demonstrate it in different ways. And that one kid might sit with a paper and pencil and answer questions, get a high score, but not be able to perform at the blackboard. And another kid might not do so well with the paper and pencil. But when you tell them, ask them to show you how to solve the problem, they reveal that they, they have a deep understanding. And I was asking, and, I, and that makes sense to me. And therefore, you would want to have a variety of different ways of assessing and not just rely on one uh, narrow way of assessing. If the hypothesis is true that people are different in that respect, then it follows from that that you'd want to be different in how you assess. And then I ask, OK, but I, you know, the predicate uh, going into this part of the conversation was there are racial differences in the representation amongst people doing science, doing technical, doing theoretical physics or doing quantitative economics. There's blacks are whatever percent, 12% of the population, and we're like 2% or even less in some of these fields of people doing this stuff. And other groups are overrepresented. Jews are overrepresented, Asians are overrepresented, whatnot. And when you look at the test scores, the test scores kind of kind of line up with the representation numbers in terms of who's in the very highest rank of the people performing on the test, which does not necessarily proxy their ability. I don't know about this young man who's taken Math, my guess is he's going to ace any test that you give him, but, you know, I could be wrong mm -hmm. about that. But anyway, my point was, do you th see a relevance between this kind of diversity of assessment and the racial representation? Do you think blacks, underrepresented minorities, historically excluded marginalized groups ought in some sense be looked upon as different with respect to how they show their excellence and that their underrepresentation is partly a result of institutions not adopting a more uh, heterogeneous, more diverse way of assessing talents? Yeah, no, so, um, I say, I, I've, again, from my observation of all different sorts of students, I fundamentally believe, it is my fundamental hypothesis because it's just a belief system, but it's based on some education, my own interacting with thousands of students over the last 17 years, is that I see no difference in 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 terms of in a, if you want to say, um, um, you know, the phenotypical representations of race and 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 performance and the poten potential to perform in in these exams or to ability to do versus other compared to other other races or and also across uh, across gender. I, I see I I, I see that. Those different forms of intelligence, right, are randomly dis distributed across those populations. That's my 
hypothesis. That's how I approach my students. Now, having said that, I think that there are other factors that can account, I found to be to account for the gap, the performance gap. One factor that I found and I've played on was um, just like this program I founded at Dartmouth called the EE Just program. When I started with that program, um, during that time, this was, I don't know, this was in 2008, I believe. Um, there were four students in that program. This program was designed for um, students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and it was named the EE Just Scholars Program, named after the pioneer and black biologist, Ernest Everett Just, um, one of the fathers of epigenetics, who went, who went to Dartmouth. But in a nutshell, the program was, was designed or the I guess the goal of the program was to fix the retention problem. You know, the fact that 50%, I'm sorry, 90% or some large number of students that came into that school to pursue a science field um, didn't, when these were dropped out of that and went to something else. Well, I can say that, you know, four years later, that 20% number or whatever that number was, I don't want to quote a definite number, that number went to 90%. And, and the other thing that was interesting was that the performance wasn't just students getting by. At the, right? Students were excelling. Students were applying to get into PhD program. I just found that one of my students from that program, Jared, I'm going to um, big him up, Jared Boyce, um, just got into an MD PhD program in neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin. And, you know, he's a black kid from, from New York City who went to Dartmouth. And I think one of the main things also was just, you know, a lot of these kids, they didn't have, I'm going to say, uh, for them, they, just simply seeing a black professor, science professor, I mean, I'm actually now talking about myself, who actually held them to, uh, who came to them was said, like, listen, this C is not good enough, buddy. I need to see some A's here. I expect you to do this because I think you're brilliant, but you know what? I'm up till three in the morning calculating. What are you doing? <laughs> like, I think that if you want to call culture within the academy of really having, having them see um, future versions of themselves and see those examples, it's just like, I don't know if I saw Michael Jordan, there was a statement that I think remember, remember sort of Michael Jordan was like, yo, yo, you guys think I have all this talent. Maybe I do. But I practice my left hand for hours every day, over and over and over again. And oh, we, if Michael Jordan could do that, I should do that too. I think that these things we um, go overlooked. Having more, you know, I'll be honest, Glenn. Like you know, I you know, as a young faculty person, a younger person, I I used to look at your work, and just by you know, I said, look, go go get your papers and try to understand the equations. And as a younger person in a quantitative field, I was like, okay, I need to do this. I need to rise to this higher occasion. And this is going to take some blood, sweat, and tears. So anyway, that's kind of an example of um, what I think is um, possible. Um, so simply put, having more Michael Jordans out there in, the, in, in physics. That, you know.